Hi, Robin. It's so great to have this opportunity to chat with you today. Um, even more special because I know that we have you at the crack of dawn there at Davos as you uh, meet with world leaders and executives and, and thought leaders um, from all over the world. Um, and you're there at, at such an important time uh, with the launch of the Good Work Standards. Um, it would be wonderful just to hear from you, Robin, uh, the role that we've played in, in supporting this initiative and, and, and what the Good Work Standards are all about. Yeah, Cynthia, it's lovely to be here with you. Um, so we're really excited at Mercer to have played a role in partnering with the World Economic Forum on, on the Good Work Framework. Um, it's, uh, it underpins an alliance of many, many organizations. I think we're up to maybe 21 at this point, all of whom have signed up um, to this charter for good work. And uh, again, you know, over the course of the better part of the last year, we've had the privilege of working with all of these organizations to drive some consensus and agree to a set of minimum standards, as well as a set of aspiration goals um, around areas like promoting fair pay and social justice, providing flexibility and protection for all workers, um, not just employees, but everyone who touches an organization's value chain, uh, delivering on health and well-being, um, driving diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then lastly, fostering employability and a learning culture so the workforce can stay relevant for a changing world. So timely, um, Robin, um, as you might know, here in Australia, we are now under new government. Um, our elections were just this past weekend, and we're not unique to a number of changes happening all over the world right now. And everything you've just mentioned um, around the changing work patterns, flexibility, uh, equity, sustainability are all top of mind, uh, particularly here in Australia and in New Zealand. Um, tell us a little bit more about what you think will help organizations live up to these promises that we're talking about in this framework. Yeah, you know, Cynthia, at the heart of much of what we're seeing in terms of this change, and this really kind of underpins my, my recent book, Work Without Jobs, that I co-authored with John Goudreau, um, and it really builds on the first three books that John and I wrote. But as we look at this emergence of the world of work post-pandemic, if I will be but to be so bold as to say that, um, <clears throat> there's really two things that seem to be coming to the fore consistently. The first is, how do we redesign work to enable talent to flow to it as seamlessly as possible while sending talent the signals and the resources to enable its perpetual reinvention as work changes? And then the second key variable here is, how do we re-envision the talent experience so we can meet more and more people on their individual terms in a manner that's equitable, inclusive, as opposed to the, our traditional frames of reference as organizations where we forced people to comply with our one size fits most. Um, and I really do think those two pivotal questions um, are really at the heart of what's gonna shape the world of work. It's certainly what underpins what we've just talked about with the Good Work Framework, it's certainly a core underpinning for much of the research that John and I have done that has been the basis for, for work without jobs. And it's coming out um, in, in, you know, in spades in our recent research, um, global talent trends um, that Mercer has now done for, the, for over a decade. Yeah, you know, speaking of the global talent trends, that has uh, absolutely been trending, if you will, um, here in Australia and New Zealand. In fact, we were just, uh, with a major core bank earlier today, just discussing those trends, and they certainly are resonating. One of those trends is working in partnership, and that really does seem to uh, belie the, the meaning behind the good work standards. Uh, when you think about working in partnership and with the organizations that we consult to have worked with, what, what are some of the key standout items that those organizations are doing well in relation to working in partnership? Yeah, you know, I, I think it goes back to that second question I just talked about, right, where, you know, instead of forcing talent to come to us on our terms as, as an organization, and very much, typically, that's a one size fits most sort of option, to increasingly saying, I'm going to meet you on your terms, you know, I'm going to be inclusive, I'm going to be, as we say at Mercer, right, um, leading with economics and empathy, you know, what does empathy actually mean? 
Um, but, you know, an understanding of what it means to walk in that other person's shoes um, and being, you know, able to be a much, lot more inclusive and recognizing that that work experience is just such a unique one. And I think what we've seen with the pandemic is that that very personalized experience laid bare for all to see on Zoom. Um, and I think we see so many organizations now, you know, recalibrating to recognize that they've got an opportunity to not think about people working for them, but to think about the workforce working with them in pursuit of a common mission and purpose. So much of what we're seeing with um, our large clients around the world is, how do I index um, the way I engage with talent? A, to meet them on their terms, but B, to also ensure that I'm reframing culture, reframing what it means to be a part, a member of this enterprise, not so much in terms of competitive pay and benefits and, you know, and, and, a, and a work environment where we spent 40 hours a week. I mean, those are still important, but increasingly how the mission and purpose that I advocate for um, aligns with the mission, the impact you individually would like to make uh, on this planet. Oh, it's just inspiring um, altogether just to hear you articulate in that way, Robin. You did mention, though, a couple of interesting points just now around work practices, and um, this is certainly top of mind, and we know that Davos, uh, there's been discussion already about four-day work week. Uh, we report on that as well in the global talent trends. 36% of organizations are now offering four-day work week. Um, you know, what, how, what are you seeing sort of in these trends as, as more flexible options seem to be at play? Is that really all it takes to get us to the group work standards? Is it not really coming down to four day work weeks or is there more? I think there's a, there's a lot more to it. Um, you, know, I, you know, as we, we look at those five categories I started off talking about, it's really about the entire, everything that touches the work experience. You know, it's, it's certainly flexibility and, and protection and, and things like portability, um, because in certain countries like the United States, things like healthcare and pensions are so you know, intricately tied to um, your status as an employee um, versus in other countries around the world, there is a lot more flexibility and protection even as people move. So trying to drive more of a level playing field just on that one topic. I think this notion of you know, recognizing that mental well-being um, is, is, has been really uh, uh, put at risk for, for many individuals over the course of the last two years. Um, and, you know, um, the recognition that we have to keep the workforce relevant for a changing world, this notion of employability and a learning culture and driving greater learning agility. So I think it's a, a bit more than a four-day work week, but I do think, Cynthia, too, the essence of that four-day work week is, is really around flexibility and as we often say to our clients, it's not flexibility if it's not a choice. Um, so a four-day work week is great, but there really has to be embedded in that a sense of choice and control and ownership. Oh, that's a really neat way of putting it. And I think to that point about choice and something that um, really resonates with so many that you've talked about both in your book and also in discussions in different forums is skills being the new currency of our time. Um, and, and I know that certainly here in Australia, um, we're at record unemployment lows right now. Um, we've actually dipped below 4% um, and, uh, and it continues to drop. Um, as we think about skills, reskilling, upskilling, um, you know, what would you recommend to organizations in Australia and New Zealand in regards to skills and how to best recognize, leverage them uh, to help navigate this new way of working? Yeah, you know, that's, that's such a great question. Um, as, as you know, we really are seeing this massive pivot from the job as the currency of work to, the sk to skills as the currency of work. And what I think it drives is a much greater level of agility in organizations as they shift from that one-to-one -one relationship between a job and a job holder to the many-to-many -many between the unique bundle of skills that Cynthia versus Robin and the many different ways in which we could contribute. Um, and I, what we're seeing is that greater agility is allowing organizations to move, to, to think of talent as being much more 
I, I, I want to say fungible, but fungible uh, doesn't quite capture it, but recognizing that we have more utility players and talent who can contribute in so many different ways beyond what we might have traditionally limited them to with a job. And I think it's really at the heart of what is, I know um, you've been talking to many organizations about this, Cynthia, is it's why the internal talent marketplace is becoming such a, I don't know how to phrase, hot phenomenon. Um, and it's, it's not just hot because it's a fad, but it's because it's time is here. And as we see organizations move from that one-to-one -one relationship and those architectures of jobs, job holders to seeing the value of talent being deployed to work more seamlessly through projects and assignments and gigs alongside jobs, what we're seeing are these massive gains in productivity with various clients um, as they move in that direction and as they start to see you know, skills really manifesting as being the currency for work in their enterprises. I, 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 we are excited by that future. And, and one of the things we really loved about your book is you, the book seems to lay out this wonderful recipe um, or methodology um, to really think about this in a, system, in a sort of systems way. I think, in fact, you use the term operating system. And, and I think that, you know, if you could summarize two or three top things that organizations can do if they are to pursue a more learning-driven talent uh, management um, system, what would you recommend as those top two or three things? Yeah, you know, um, in, in the book, and, you know, we, we call it a new work operating system because our, our traditional work operating system has been one indexed to this notion of jobs and job holders. And as we move to one where skills and capabilities are the currency of work, there's really four principles that we see consistently coming to the fore, Cynthia, in governing that pivot. The first is starting with the work, you know, the current and future tasks, not just the way they're organized in jobs. Secondly, ensuring that we're seeing that nuanced way in which automation comes into organizations when you lead with the work. So getting to the optimal combinations of talent and technology, where you have a clear sense of where activities are substituted versus augmented versus created as a result of the presence of automation. Thirdly, ensuring that we're thinking about how we connect talent to work in ever more agile ways, you know, beyond just the job, but thinking about the internal gig, um, freelancers, alliances, projects, you know, there's a whole myriad uh, different ways in which we can connect people to work. And then lastly, ensuring that we're creating the con conditions for the perpetual reinvention of work and continuously looking for opportunities to take the friction out of how we connect people to work, enabling them to flow to work versus defaulting to thinking about, you know, jobs and job holders. Yeah, it's, it's super exciting. And you know, at the same time, Robin, it feels the right time to tackle this as organizations um, with the coming together of technology, of data, we have more data about our workforces, about people than we've ever had before. Um, we continue to create that data, great volumes, um, structures and processes um, as laid out in your book, for example, give you know, a simple, concise recipe to get there. One thing I wanted to ask you about as we kind of come to the close of our discussion today is the human-centered leadership that will help drive this um, throughout all organizations. What would you give advice to, or what would your advice be like if you were giving advice to chief people officers, uh, CEOs, chief risk officers as we embark on this new life working? Yeah, you know, Cynthia, it's a great question because this pivot from thinking of work being bound up in jobs, and if you think of everything in, or in organizations that is indexed to that, right? You've got your job architectures, you've got your traditional org structures, everything sort of layers up based on that fundamental unit of a job. And in HR, you know, we surround that structure with our talent life cycle. And the, what we ask of leaders and how we think of leaders and how we, you know, classify them, right? And again, I think as we move to a world where skills are the currency of work, we see a much more human-centric model for getting work done. And that really is what underpins the good work standards, certainly is the heart of, our, of what is that, um, what we wrote about work with our jobs. But it does require some very different leadership muscle, you know, the capacity to orchestrate work 
um, is, is a really significant new skill as opposed to traditional model of, you know, delegating and opening requisitions and um, structuring work in, in, in traditional functions. Um, I think we see more and more, um, you know, work being flowed to talent as opposed to talent being organized around processes um, because of the greater human centricity of work. Um, you see leaders being asked to think in a much more nuanced fashion about automation. You know, how does automation play out given that human centricity, given the work, as opposed to I've got a process and now I've got some new tech and I'm going to figure out how to apply that technology to the process. Um, and so you, you really do start to see a very different set of leadership puzzles, probably the most significant one that, that John and I wrote about is this notion of, you know, as I said at the beginning, leaders shifting from leading with quote unquote hard power and being able to organize work um, in very rigid structures to increasingly leading through influence and soft power. Because you've got, you, you're really trying to sort of align and influence a much more human centric work ecosystem. And it's where the notion of leadership brand becomes really important, right? Because followership, becomes ever more important when you don't have the traditional structures that you've relied on to align people to you. Um, and instead you have a more agile enterprise where talent is flowing to work. So I think it's a really exciting time for the world of work. It sure is. I've really appreciated this conversation, Robin. Do you have any favorite places you'd like to visit? This is not your first uh, visit to the World Economic Forum, I know, but uh, any tips or tricks for anyone who's on their way out there? <laughs> <laughs> it is a, uh, it's, it's a truly one of a kind experience because of how much you have going on. And I think that really the thing that to me has, uh, has made me really enjoy it and has stretched me is the opportunity to see how what we do, what you and I do, you know, stretches and cuts across different domains. You know, I've learned things from watching some of the sessions on physics and, you know, it's made me question what I do from a human capital and the work perspective and equally sort of seeing how some of the things we've just talked about might play out in other domains. Um, so it's been really more of a learning experience than anything else. Well, we are so lucky that we were able to grab a bit of time from you this morning before you go off to your first event at the forum. Um, thank you so much, Robin, for joining us and uh, we'll go ahead and say goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Lovely to chat with you. Lovely to chat with you, Robin.